We're continuing on now in our study through the book of James. And in this letter that James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote to early Christians and to us today by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. As we come now to chapter 3, we're going to begin with the first couple verses. And in this section of James chapter 3, the focus will mainly be on the power and the responsibility of the tongue. The tongue being here a symbol for the words we say, the, the words we speak. It's really all about our speech. And the tongue is the picture of that. You'll you'll see exactly what we mean. Let's get into it here now. James chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body or the whole body. First thing we notice as we come to James chapter 3, verse 1, is he gives this sort of startling statement. At least I got to say, it's startling to me, someone who is a Bible teacher. He says, let not many of you become teachers. James had a very sober admonition to anybody who would become a teacher in the church. Those people who desire to have some kind of responsibility for teaching God's people and being preachers, proclaimers of God's word, they must take that responsibility very seriously because they have a greater accountability. They shall receive, notice the phrasing he uses here in verse 1, we shall receive a stricter judgment. I think that probably it's true that those of us who among God's people feel called to teach and preach the Bible, we probably take it too lightly. We don't consider the cost of this position in terms of accountability. Please remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 48. Jesus said this, to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to whom much have been committed, of him they will ask the more. In other words, the more knowledge you have, the more accountability you are. The more access to knowledge you have, the more accountability you have. Just this simple idea, very strong, that the more a person either is given or has access to, the greater accountability they have. This applies very directly to those who would be teachers and preachers among God's people. And this should also remind us that that, that what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, what James says right here in James chapter 3, it should remind us that being a teacher in God's church is much more than having a natural gift of teaching. It's even more than having a spiritual gift of teaching. There is an additional element of character that is rightly expected of of those who teach and preach and proclaim God's word. God's people have a right to look at those who teach. And by the way, I'll say this very strongly. They don't have the right to expect perfection in life, but they do have the right to expect a higher standard. You know, maybe in James's day, it was kind of popular to be a teacher. Maybe there were a lot of people who wanted to do it. And he says, no, I I need to warn you. You are going to face God on that day of judgment. Whatever kind of judgment you have for the judgments of works that you've done, for how you've served Christ, you are going to face a stricter judgment. We should expect that teachers are going to be tested more in this life and that they're going to be judged more strictly. Let me read you a quote from Adam Clark relevant to this. He says this, quote, Their case is awful. They shall receive greater condemnation than common sinners. They have not only sinned in thrusting themselves into that office to which God has never called them, but through their insufficiency, the flocks over they have assumed the mastery perish for lack of knowledge, and their blood will God require at the watchman's hand, end quote from Adam Clark. Adam Clark there is simply trying to explain the very heavy responsibility that someone has. And by the way, notice this. It's a funny phrasing. I don't say funny in the sense of amusing. It's just sort of an interesting phrasing that's used here in verse 1, knowing that we, James counts himself among those people who will receive this stricter judgment, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Uh, Apparently, there will be degrees of judgment. There will be degrees of strictness. 
Not every believer is going to be judged according to exactly the same standard because to more who is given, more will be required. And that is true, if anywhere, it's true among teachers, among God's people. Now, going on into verse 2, I like how James continues. He says, for we all stumble in many things. You see, the greater accountability of teachers is especially sobering. It's especially of note knowing the weaknesses that we share in common. I mean, after all, we all stumble, teachers included. A a, a man or a woman does not become a superman or a superwoman just because they start teaching the Bible and teaching it well. Look, I can tell you that after many decades of teaching the Bible, I know that people have a tendency, if you can teach a Bible study, especially if you can occasionally teach a good Bible study, people will think that you're more spiritual than you actually are. It's just the way it goes. But listen, we all stumble in many things. Now, by the way, there's a few different words in the ancient Greek language that could be translated stumble. This particular word, according to the commentaries that I've read, it doesn't imply a fatal fall, but but something that just kind of hinders somebody, trips them up and hinders their spiritual progress. So, So James isn't saying that we all fall away, we all reject Jesus. No, he's saying we all stumble. James included himself among that. But please notice this. James did not excuse his stumbling, nor will he excuse our stumbling. We know that we all stumble, but it doesn't make us to say, well, who cares about stumbling? It makes us instead to say, we're all weak. We need to run to Jesus, our Savior. We need to find our refuge in him. And we need to press on trusting Jesus Christ for a closer and better walk with him. One that is hopefully marked by less stumbling. Now, this kind of brings in a second idea in verse 2. If I could read verse 2 from the beginning, it says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. You see, having brought up this idea that we all stumble, now James is going to go on to the idea that let me tell you a way that it is common for people to stumble. It's common for them to stumble by what they say. Now, isn't this true? Don't we have a big problem today and ongoing among the people of God and among the culture at large where people just speak in an intemperate manner? They say things they shouldn't say. They type things into their social media that they shouldn't type. And what James is saying here is, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. This is a good way to measure spiritual maturity for teachers and really for everybody in the body of Christ. I mean, after all, James is talking about the idea of Bible teachers and preachers having a stricter accountability. Well, this is one place where you would expect that they should have a stricter accountability. You you should expect someone who teaches the Bible, someone who preaches God's word, you should expect that they would have a greater governance over their tongue than somebody who doesn't. They, they should just be more careful about what they say. Isn't this a, a just an obvious, evident point? I mean, after all, if you're going to use your mouth, if you're going to use your tongue to proclaim the wonderful, glorious gospel, the beautiful truth of God, to exposit the scriptures and explain them to people, should cursing and lies and ill speech come from that very tongue? I don't think so. Of course, nobody does. You see, Jesus demonstrated in Matthew chapter 12 that words are often the revelation of a person's inner character. Therefore, to not stumble in word shows true spiritual maturity. Now, we're not trying to say, and I don't think James tried to say either, that this is the only measure of spiritual maturity that's worthwhile or important. There are other measures, of course, but this is an important one, and this is one that is especially relevant to teachers and preachers who because of what they do with the words they speak, they have so much more opportunity to sin with their tongue, with the words that they say. I mean, it's possible to stumble in word about yourself. You boast, you exaggerate, you give very selective reporting, you know, kind of making yourself the hero of every story. Listen, that can be to stumble in word, can it not? We can also stumble in word about other people. We're not talking about ourselves. We're talking about other people. 
and we stumble inward through criticism, through gossip, through slander, through cruelty, through two-facedness, through anger, or through flattery and insincere words that are meant to gain favor before other people. No, brothers and sisters, it is very easy for us to sin by what we say, and James is saying that, that this is an important measure of somebody's walk with God. Now, this leads into verse 3, where he speaks in a very powerful way about the power of the tongue. You'll see what I mean as I read verses 3 through 6 here in James chapter 3. Here we go. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Wow, there is a lot for us to unpack in those four verses. First, let's go back to the beginning, verse 3. Again, the biggest theme here is talking about the power of the tongue and the responsibility of the tongue and, and how we, especially people who are teachers that have special regard for speaking what's right. Now look here at verse 3. He says, We put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us. You, you know what the bit is in the horse's mouth. You know, the bit is that little thing that goes in the horse's mouth and, and by it, they can pull and, and guide and lead the horse any way they want. A small bit in the mouth of a horse can control a big, strong horse, a horse that is much bigger and stronger than the person who's holding the bit. Along the same analogy, he says here in verse four, that a small rudder can turn a large ship. You know what the rudder is. The rudder is that little instrument at the back of the ship in the water that's like a little blade, and it's used to turn the ship one way or another. Now, even so, when we have control over our tongue, it is an indication that we have control over ourself. Whoever can control the tongue can, remember this phrase from verse 2 that we just looked at a moment ago, Whoever can control the tongue can bridle the whole body. And the whole illustration James is making here is very plain. The bit is relatively small in the horse's mouth. The rudder is relatively small compared to the ship. But yet, if they are not controlled, the horse is out of control, the ship is out of control. And your tongue is small compared to your whole body. There's lots of things in your body that are bigger than your tongue, your hand, your biceps, your legs, your foot, you go on and on, lots of organs in your body. There's lots of things in your body, body that are bigger than your tongue. However, however, something as small as the tongue can have a tremendous power in your life for either good or evil. That's the whole point. Now notice this as well. You don't solve the problem of an unruly horse by keeping it in the barn. You don't solve the problem of a hard-to-steer ship by keeping it tied to the dock. In the same way, we may find it tempting to take a vow of silence to control our tongue, but that's not God's purpose. God's purpose. Now, look, I suppose we could all do with speaking less. James has already talked to us about that in the first couple of chapters, how it's wise for us to speak less and listen more. But ultimately speaking, the, the, the real thing we need to do is not stop speaking, but to let the Holy Spirit of God fill us and control us and walk consistent with the Holy Spirit so that we would speak what we should speak and not say what we should avoid saying. Now, I, I want you to consider one other thing about this just brilliant spirit-inspired uh, picture here. Think of the idea of a bit in the horse's mouth, right? You got that picture. And then you also have the picture of the rudder that's stirring, stirring, steering the ship. What, what, what's really the factor in both of those things? 
The factor is who or what holds the reins of the horse, who or what directs the rudder. Now, you could say this if you want to make the analogy going to what we say, going to the tongue. You could say some people have no hand on the reins, no hand on the rudder when it comes to their speech. They say whatever comes into their mind. That's not a good place. Now, other people have a hand on the reins of their tongue or the rudder of what they the rudder of their words, you could say. But but they just speak according to their emotions, according to their own carnal nature. That's not good either. What James is pointing us towards is to have the spirit of God working through the new man, directing our hands on the reins and the rudder that is our tongue and controls our words. Now, if we fail to do this, if we fail to take hold of the reins, and again, I'm not trying to apply for a moment that you can do this apart from the filling of the Holy Spirit, that you can do this without a constant reliance upon the Holy Spirit of God. But with, with the hand on the reins, the hand on the rudder of our words, if we fail to do this, what's going to be the result? It can be disaster. Look at verse 5. See how great a forest a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. You know, I live here in Southern California, and in the community that I'm speaking to you from right now, Santa Barbara, California, we know wildfires. It seems like every few years we have wildfires that burn up in the beautiful hills uh, just just up above us here in Santa Barbara. And people have to evacuate their houses and sometimes homes get burned and sometimes people lose their lives and, and much land and such is burned and it's devastating to the ecology and all the rest of it. And, and this is just what we say. We understand that a very small spark, a very small flame can ignite a, a very costly and huge and dangerous destructive fire. Well, in the same way, that tongue in our mouth, it is relatively small, but it is a fire. It is a potential world of iniquity. And that fire of the tongue has been used to burn many people. And when I was little, there was a children's rhyme. Uh, it started even before I was little. It had been around a long time. But children were told to repeat a rhyme like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's kind of a rhyme we learned when we were kids. And the idea was, okay, yeah, you know, some real damage might come to you if a stick hits your arm or a stone hits your head. But what somebody says to you or says about you, that doesn't really harm you. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Let me tell you something. That child's rhyme is not really true. Matter of fact, the bitter pain of a word that is spoken against us can hurt us for a lifetime long after that broken bone is healed. The bitter pain of a word that is spoken against you can hinder, even cripple your life. You see, what others say to us and what we say to others can last a long time for, brothers and sisters, for either good or evil. That, that casual, sarcastic, or critical remark, that can inflict a lasting injury on another person. But let me show you the flip side. That well-timed, even if it's spontaneous, but that well-timed encouragement or compliment can inspire somebody for the rest of their life. Oh, there's power in the words that we use. Now, there's power also, we see this in our modern age, something that James knew about in principle, but not in how it would be worked out in technology. There's power also in social media. And the way that Christians sometimes represent themselves in social media, man, it's a disgrace. It's a sin. The, their tongue isn't being used literally, but the words by their thumbs as they type in messages into their smartphones or, or, or type on their computers or whatever it is, man, it is, it is setting up destructive fires. 
You know, the book of Proverbs, which again, so many similarities between this letter that James wrote and the book of Proverbs. Proverbs speaks to us of the person who never considers the destructive power of his words. I love this from Proverbs chapter 26, verses 18 and 19. Are you ready for this one? Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. You know, there's a lot of that, isn't there? Isn't there a lot of uh, deception and, and carelessness? And, and hurtful words spoken. And then we just try to just shrug it off as a light thing. Ah, oh, well, no big deal. It is a big deal. It's a madman thinking that it doesn't do anything. Now, again, I want to warn you. James is not telling us to never speak. He's not telling you and me to take a vow of silence. In many ways, that would be easier than exercising true self-control over the tongue. You know, it's true that the bridle in the horse's mouth, if it's not controlled well or not controlled, it'll do a lot of damage. The rudder on the ship, if it's not controlled well or if it's not controlled at all, it can do a lot of damage. The fire can do tremendous damage. Listen, every one of those things, the bridle, the rudder, and the fire, they can do tremendous good when they are controlled properly. And so when we read these words of James here in James chapter 3, we soberly consider the destructive potential of the tongue, but we also very carefully consider what a wonderful tool for a blessing and strengthening and edification and just beauty the tongue can be. But out of control, what he says about it in verse 6 is true. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. I want you to think about it in this way. There aren't many sins that don't involve talking in some way. Almost any sin that you can think of involves talking. I like what one commentator named Burdick said. He said this, quote, It is though all the wickedness in the whole world were wrapped up in that little piece of flesh. And sometimes it seems like that. And again, all I can tell you is that James echoes the testimony of the book of Proverbs regarding the tongue. Listen, a really fruitful study for you to do some other time is to just go through the book of Proverbs and see everything it says about the tongue, the words we speak. Let me give you just a few other ones. I already read to you Proverbs chapter 26, verses 18 and 19. Let me read you some other ones here. Proverbs chapter 10, verses 19 through 21. Ready for this? In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of wisdom. There, uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verses 19 through 21, speaking to us about the power of the tongue for good and for evil. Now, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. We can make other people glad through our good words. Now, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Amen to that. And then the final one I'm going to read to you is Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. If you could memorize any one proverb about the tongue, about the words we use, I think this would be a good one. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Wow. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, this gives us the great responsibility, and if we want to go back to the first couple verses of the chapter, especially the great responsibility that there are to teachers, we get that, but please check this out. Now he's going to speak to us, starting at verse 7, about the difficulty of taming the tongue. Ready for this? He says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. 
It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. James makes a very interesting and I think wise observation here. In verse 7, he says, every kind of beast and bird has been tamed by mankind. Isn't it true? Lions have been tamed. Tigers have been tamed. Elephants have been tamed. Uh, killer whales have been tamed. I, I mean, every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. It's absolutely true. But a wild animal can more easily be tamed than the tongue. In fact, James tells us, did you see it there in verse 8? No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You know, there's something in the human spirit, the, the, the human nature that God has given us, that we have an incredible capacity for sacrifice and self-control. Every once in a while, you'll hear somebody who has some radical survival story. You know, they're out in the woods and there's nobody else around and their foot gets caught in a bear trap. And they actually, and forgive the, you know, sort of gross speaking here, but they actually have to like take out a knife and cut off their legs so that they can survive or their arm gets wedged in a rock. And the only way that they can get it is to amputate their own arm and make it. I mean, we, we hear these fantastic stories of incredible self-sacrifice. But I want you to think that that man who is capable of cutting off his own arm so that he could survive, that man, same man, can't tame his tongue perfectly. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Now, even though no man can tame the tongue, that's exactly what he says there in verse 8. Can I tell you something? The tongue can be brought under the power and the control of the Holy Spirit. We might say that the only power in the universe mightier than the human tongue is God himself. But thanks be to God, he is mightier. And when we read verses like this, verses 7 and 8, when we read verses like this in the book of James that tells us that no man can tame the tongue, you know what it points us toward? It points us towards Jesus. You think about it, how amazing Jesus was. Jesus, who never sinned in a word that he ever said. Jesus never sinned with words. He never sinned by an unkind, unwise, unworthy, unholy thing that his tongue spoke. Never, never. And that same Jesus lives inside of the believer. You know, we're going to keep making our way on. and We're going to end this study at verse 12. But I just want to remind you, brothers and sisters, do not forget this. This matter of taming the tongue is not a matter of gritting your teeth and trying harder. Now, I'll be straight with you. There's some of us, we do need to try harder. We just have been inattentive towards this. We've given it very little regard. We're just sort of careless. We do need to take more care. There's true that there's some place for that in the Christian life. I'm not denying that. But in the big picture, please realize this, that, that, that your victory in this is not going to come just by you trying harder. Your victory is going to come by your surrender to Jesus Christ and your abiding in him and realizing two things. First of all, that the sacrifice of Jesus is capable to forgive you of sin, even the sins that you commit by the words you say. Thanks be to God. Secondly, we realize that it's only Christ in me that has the capability of doing anything like that. And I should be uh, drawing close to Jesus and letting that one who never sinned in anything that he said, I should be letting that one speak to me and through me. Now, it is true. The tongue is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Kind of reminds me of a story that I read about John Wesley. A uh, woman once came up to John Wesley and said, John Wesley, I think I know what my talent is from God. You know, and she's talking about this parable of the talents where a master gave talents to everybody and they're supposed to use them. And Christians use that as an illustration. Jesus used it as, you know, God gives us talents. He gives us abilities and we're supposed to use them for his kingdom. So a woman once came to John Wesley and she said, hey, I know what my talent is. I think my talent from God is to speak my mind. That's what she said. Wesley replied, you know, I don't think God would mind if you buried that talent, sister. And isn't it true? Speaking forth everything that just comes into our mind, it's unwise. It's poisonous speech, as James says in verse 8. But now let's move on to verse 9, and we're going to read through to the end of verse 12. And this will be the last section 
that we take a consideration of in this particular study here. Verse 9. With it, and again, he's speaking about the tongue here, with the words we say. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. James is just sort of here right along with us. He's marveling at the contradictory nature of the tongue. With my tongue, I can bless my God and Father. I can worship him. I can praise him. And with that same tongue, I can actually go out and curse people. The tongue can be used for the highest calling, worshiping and blessing God. And it can be used for the lowest evil to curse and inspire men to wickedness. And to those who are born again, it should not be this way. It is as James wrote to us in verse 10, that it should not be that out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. Think about the almost uncountable examples that we have of this in the Gospels. Peter's tongue confesses Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Peter's tongue denied Jesus with curses. The same John, who later on wrote, little children, love one another, he's the one who wanted to say a word to bring down fire from heaven upon a Samaritan village. We find this contradictory nature, and all we can say is, right along with James verse 10, these things ought not to be so. Ideally, the goal we should strive for, what God wants to work in us by his, his sanctifying, developing work in our life, our Christian growth, is that our speech would be consistently glorifying to God. And by the way, one thing that this means is that we shouldn't use one vocabulary or one tone of speaking at church and then another one at home, maybe another one on the job. Listen, I'm thinking of the person. And I'll be honest, I don't have any specific face or name in mind, but, but I know that, that this is us as, as people. I'm thinking of the person who when they go to church, it's praise the Lord, bless you, brother. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of God? Hallelujah. And that, that person goes home and they are nothing but critical and cruel and abusive and hateful with their words in their home. And then they go to their job. And at their job, they're telling that dirty joke. At the job, they're... Uh, speaking to other people in the office with flirtatious words and sexually suggestive things and on and on. And just as James says, my brethren, this should not be so. It shouldn't be that we have one way that we speak at church, another way we speak in the home, a third way that we speak at the job. No, like our, our mouth should be like a spring of water sending forth fresh not fresh and bitter from the same opening. Because ultimately, this is powerful what he says in verse 12, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. That's what he says in verse 12. James is pointing to the ultimate impossibility of such a strong contradiction. If bad fruit and bitter water continue to come forth, it means that there isn't really a contradiction. The tree is bad. The spring is bad. Don't forget what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 12. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 37, that a person's words are a reliable revelation of their inner character. It's entirely possible that what you are in the habit of saying is a revelation of who you are. Listen, I, I, I'm not trying to throw a guilt trip on anybody. I'm not trying to make people paranoid about one or two bad words that they say. This, But I'm trying to say this. What you are in the habit of saying is something of an accurate revelation, revelation of who you are. And that's why he says, Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? 
How weird that would be, isn't it? There's a fig tree. You go up to the fig tree. And by the way, as I'm speaking this, just outside this little office that we have in our back garden here in Santa Barbara, just outside of this office is a fig tree. And in the front of our yard, we've got an olive tree. And how strange it would be if I went out to this fig tree that's just outside this door here. And I went up to that fig tree and there's olives on it. I go, well, that's strange. It doesn't work that way. And so a Christian life should not bear the fruit of iniquity. The fig tree should bear figs. The olive tree should bear olives. This is how it should be. Now, we cannot bear this fruit to God that we should apart from the transforming work of the Holy Spirit within us. The basic ethic of Christianity, and let's be honest, this letter that James wrote is pretty big on ethics. It's telling us how to live. This is a very practical, ethical book. James is not telling us so much how to be saved. He's telling us how those people who are saved should be living. But don't miss this thing, this idea. Basically, in the Christian life, ethics flows from this philosophy. You need to be what you are. In other words, if you are a new creature in Jesus Christ, if you've been transformed by the Holy Spirit of God, then go out and live what God has made you. Because fundamentally, that's all we can be anyway. You know, you can label a fig tree olive tree. It doesn't make it an olive tree. You could take out your pruning shears and trim a fig tree to look more like an olive tree. That doesn't make it an olive tree. You can treat a fig tree as if it was an olive tree, and that's not going to make it an olive tree. You can surround a fig tree with many olive trees, and that's not going to make it an olive tree. You could transplant that fig tree to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, and that will not make it an olive tree. You know, if it's going to be an olive tree, it has to be because it's been born into being an olive tree. And as much as anything, this very practical, very challenging exhortation from James because, brothers and sisters, I hope you've received it here today. I hope you've received this idea. Listen, it is absolutely true. I need, through the work of the Holy Spirit in my life, through His constant transforming, I need to govern what I say better. I need to let what I say be more of a blessing to people and less of a burden or a curse upon anybody. I need that. Now, that being the case, that's only going to happen when God does his transforming work in my life. It's not a matter of me gritting my teeth and trying harder. It's a matter of me looking to my Savior and resting in the one who has the true power of transformation. I don't have the power to transform my own life, but he has the power to transform me. I want to abide in him, walk in him, put my focus on him, and, and, be serious about doing what he says, about obeying him. And then I'll see the work of God happen in my life more and more. That's where we're going to end it off here at the end of verse 12. Next time we pick it up at verse 13 of James chapter 3 as we continue on in our study through the book of James. 